Hey guys, welcome back to another Freaky Fast Friday episode where we give you the scoop on a case in 30 minutes or less. So sit back, make yourself a drink or a cup of tea, and join us for this week's episode. <laughs> Is that your like countdown? Like Wait. three, two, one. Wait, or like you just, don't you don't say it. the two and the one, right? Three, two. <laughs> I felt so professional doing that. That was awesome. It, well, that's what they do, right? They they say three, two, don't say the one, but they mm-hmm. put a one up and then like they point and that's like when they are rolling or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Very professional. Love it. Anyway, oh, guys, gosh. welcome back. Um, We missed somewhat of a milestone last time um, that we kind of just forgot to mention, but we hit our 20th episode, which is kind of cool. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> Wait, what, what is song that is sound that? effect? <laughs> Wait, do you guys watch The Young Turks? No, not really. Oh yes. <laughs> and now whenever I something hear it. whenever okay. something happens whenever something like positive happens, they play the Yeah, okay. Now I hear it. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so our Monday episode, um for some reason I always already forgot who it was. Oh, our Monday episode, Samuel Little, um, that was our 20th episode, which is kind of cool because he's, I feel like that was a cool 20th episode because he's, like, a very notorious serial killer, like, huge thing. He'd also recently died. Like, it was kind of a cool, like, even though we unintentionally did that. But anyway, I don't know how you guys feel, but it, we this, always like, very much intentionally, always. Like, <laughs> how we p- totally planned the Lizzie Borden episode to come out right after we found out that her house was for sale. That was yeah. planned. No, I mean. Totally planned. They're all, well, like, and- happy conse- – wait, what's it? Happy coincidences? No, what happy it? mistakes. Ha- Isn't it the- happy mistakes? Yeah, whatever. You know Happy what I mean. accidents. Happy accidents. Happy accidents. They're all happy accidents. Yeah, you're talking about uh, – what's his face? Paul Brass. Um, Paul Brass. Bob Brass. Um – Anyway, like, really quick, I just thought it'd be kind of cool because we, all three of us kind of, like, started this podca- podcast very much as, like, a hobby. Would you guys disagree? Like, No, for I, sure. And I, for some reason, I had this feeling that we would have dropped off by now. Um, really? <laughs> and I know that's very negative of me, but... Caitlin is, um... <laughs> I, I Overachiever. Say, I wouldn't say pessimist, but she's very, she's very much a realist. <laughs> She is. Well, I am a realist, and I we all have like very separate lives. We all have very busy, busy lives. lives. And yeah. Like, like we're like true. I was saying earlier, we have like started doing all these things in quarantine where we like we started the book club and we started the podcast and we started what we've been watching The Bachelor together. Like it's kind of all it's like kind of my guilty pleasure. That's what I call it because it's like totally unreasonable, ridiculous reality show but like but I it's really also kind love... of an escape it's an escape from real life you know yeah anyway i just think it's cool that we've made it this far and yeah i don't sure. know maybe maybe a year from now we're gonna be I like on like episodes or 100 or i don't know depends don't on if we continue works. on the streak that we're doing but <laughs> we would be at um, more episodes than we are at now that's all we need to know about the math <laughs> that's how math works <laughs> i mean yes. we'll see we'll see um Anyways, so this week I thought I'd bring in, like, a kind of, like, retro, like, um, it's like a Y2K, like, case. It's been unsolved for a long time, and it's, like, a very beloved person that I think so many people want justice for, and that is Jennifer Servo. So Jennifer Lynn Servo was a news reporter from Montana who was murdered just months after beginning a full-time reporter job at KRBC-TV in Abilene, Texas. Um, I, I think it's Abilene, maybe Abilene. Um, Servo was found strangled and with significant head trauma in her Abilene apartment just one week before her 23rd birthday on September 16th, 2002. Oh, my God. The two immediate suspects at the time were her boyfriend, um, Ralph Sepulveda, ex-boyfriend, sorry, ex-boyfriend Ralf Sepulveda, I believe is his last name, and a worker, Brian Travers, um, or a co-worker, sorry, Brian Travers. To this day, no arrests have been made, and the case has gone very cold. Um, so chili Jennifer, even. chili, you say chili. Chili, um, even. 
Jennifer Servo was born September 23rd, 1979 in Columbia Falls, Montana. She graduated Columbia Falls High School in 1998, um, and there was actually a scholarship here in her name um, in, in honor of her that is gifted every year to someone wishing to go into broadcast journalism, which I think is really cool. So while attending University of Montana, Servo's goal had always been to be the next Katie Couric. Couric? 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 I've always said Katie Couric. Why can't I? I think it's just Couric. Couric, For some reason that sounds wrong to me. Anyway. I mean, you could call her Couric, but she probably wouldn't like that. (laughs) Couric. Couric. Like she's listening. I think I'm overthinking the pronunciation of it. Couric. Um, and she, she really wanted to work for one of, like, the big news networks, right? Like, ABC, whatever. What are some... Good Morning America? I don't know. Um, I don't really watch the news. I don't like the news. Uh, (laughs) when she graduated college in May, May 2002, um, she already, she already had experience working for news networks, um, during college. And during college, she had worked for both, uh, K-Pax TV and Missoula, and then, K-E-C-I TV, which was, like, ABC Montana, and it was, like, it served the, I believe, the western side of Montana. Uh, so, flash forward to September 15th, 2002. So, she's, like, freshly out of college. She's just landed what she thinks is going to be, like, a stepping stone job to being the next Katie Couric, you know? Mm-hmm. So, she just got a job at, um... I forget what the station's called already. KRBC TV and Abilene, 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 Abilene. <laughs> Jennifer, um, on September fifteenth, two thousand two, had been running errands during the day with a coworker, Brian Travers, who was a weatherman at the station. Um, I believe he was twenty four. They picked up a coffee table and, from a friend, and later in the day, made a trip to Walmart. Um. Travers claims that sometime while they were dirt while they were driving, um, so D- Servo was driving, but at some point she made a comment to how, about how the per- the car behind them had been like following them, or that she thought that they were being followed. And um, Travers again, this is Travers's claim. We don't know if this is mm-hmm. true, but um, Jennifer Servo dropped her friend off at home, and um, she just went home. She got home around midnight on the 15th, going into the 16th. So, phone records indicate that Servo phoned an ex-boyfriend in Montana, Dave Warren, when she first got home. Um, This was, I believe, like, a pretty long-term relationship for her. And she had... They had, like, left on pretty good terms. Uh, Warren later said that she didn't mention being followed on the phone call, which is interesting. Um... Because what a weird detail for an innocent man to say. And don't get me wrong, I don't believe Travers did it, but it's just, like, an interesting thing to say and have it not be true. Not to say that it's not true, but it, as a woman, if I... Not to mention that when they were leaving Brian Travers' apartment, because she stopped at the at her his apartment, Brian was like, can I walk you to your car? And she's like, no, it's okay. And Brian was like, well, I made kind of made sense because I could see her car from my apartment door. So I just watched her to go down. But Mm -hmm. as a woman, like, it seems really weird to deny somebody walking you to your car, you know. Um, But again, like a weird detail, probably not, doesn't mean anything. Um, I'm kind of trying to include lots of perspectives because, again, this is unsolved and I'd love to hear everybody's theory. Um... So, sometime in the early hours of September 16th, um, Jennifer was murdered. A maintenance employee of the apartment complex um, discovered Jennifer Servo's body on the bathroom floor of her apartment two days later on September 18th. Um, This was after the news director of the station had called the complex worried about her. Um, Rightfully so, like he hadn't heard from her in two days. Probably, like, more like three. Um, There was evidence of sexual assault, but she was found fully clothed. It appeared that the attack had started in her bedroom and she was dragged into the bathroom. Um, She had suffered both blunt force trauma to the head as well as um, had been strangled. There was DNA from both um, Sepulveda and Travers in the apartment, 
but a lot of the evidence of the crime had been disturbed by Servo's cat, Mr. Binks. Um, they actually, they, at the time, collected, like, tons of, like, trace evidence, like, fiber evidence, hair evidence, all that. But, like, about half of it was cat hair. Like, all, and then the cat hair was all mixed in with all the other trace evidence. So, it made it really hard. And plus, it wasn't, like, totally crazy for DNA of these two men to be at her apartment. Um, Sepulveda had actually moved to Texas with Jennifer, when she got the job in Abilene and um, he had briefly lived at the apartment with her before they had broke up eventually. Um, they broke up after Servo found out that Sepulveda had left behind a fiance and child in Montana <gasps> that he didn't tell her about. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So not only was she having an affair, she was having, she was the other woman in yeah, an affair. Unknowingly. Um, yeah. Unknowingly. Uh, but he also, like, left his kid and his fiance in Montana, didn't tell her about it, came to Texas. Um, they actually barely knew each other when they moved to Texas together. Like, they hadn't been dating that long. Um, Sepulveda was 34 and she was 22. Jennifer's sister, Krista, also said he was pretty rough looking for Jennifer, like, compared to her. Like, he had been, he was an ex-army ranger. He's really burly. Um, his arms were, like, covered in tattoos, like, and she's, like, this very beautiful, like, she looks like a news reporter. She's a like, beautiful blonde woman and, like, not, like, particularly, like, she's pretty petite and mm -hmm. I guess they were just, like, a weird pair. Again, though, like, it didn't really seem like Jennifer was, like, a like afraid of him by any means. So don't, don't get me wrong. Um, so Jennifer had confided to two separate friends that Sepulveda had liked um, to choke her during sex, even though Jennifer didn't really like this. This wasn't her thing. Um, admittedly, Servo's friends said that she never really seemed scared, though. Um, and there is a huge difference between strangling somebody to death and, like, choking somebody playfully during sex. Like, you know, like, those are very... Well, and also, like, if you, like, accidentally kill somebody doing that versus, like, strangling to the point where... You well, know and she had that blunt dead. force trauma to the head as right, well. Right, right. Like, yeah. Yeah. It seems it's it's somewhat unfair to be like, oh, somebody who liked to choke during t sex is capable of choking somebody to death, right? Yeah. yeah. So Dave's, um, not Dave's, Servo's best friend, Dara Riordan, had spoken to her the day before she was murdered, and Servo told her that she hadn't heard from Sepulveda for about three weeks. Um, they had split up fairly recently, and he kind of just, like, he got a job, he got a new apartment. He, not that they, like, ended on, I mean, I'm sure they didn't end on good terms, but she hadn't really talked to him or heard from him. Like, she didn't really, like, he hadn't made any attempts to, like, communicate with her, um, to say, like, he was, like, so distraught that they broke up or, like, hey, I want to get back together. Like, he – it didn't seem like that was the case. Mm -hmm. So, investigators were unable to prove or disprove Sepulveda's innocence. Um, he said he was – he said that he had, like, an alibi. He was just at his apartment um, on the night of the murder, but obviously there was nobody – at his apartment with him to corroborate this. Um, he actually seemed pretty, like, indifferent, for lack of a better word, to learning of Servo's death. That's kind and of he actually didn't even ask how she was murdered. Um, nonetheless, the police had no evidence to pin the murder on him. Like, I mean, so, there was no evidence. So I feel like if my... I think it's weird that he was indifferent. Don't get me wrong. I stand by that. That's really odd um, for your, like, ex-girlfriend. I don't care... Who you yeah. left your fiance for. Yeah, you know? right. Like there's, there is some, like a long-term relationship. I feel like there's always like some sort of emotion there. Like you wouldn't want to hear that they had been murdered, but to not want to know how, I feel like that's kind of explained, like understandable because I wouldn't really want to know how anybody like that I was close to was murdered. Like maybe, yeah. maybe, I don't know. I guess I can't really say how I would act in a case like that because it's kind of like an unimaginable thing um, well and again but like i don't know i guess that's kind of just what i think about that reacting weird to somebody to learning of somebody's death like it's tricky because like is there a right way to react yeah. and, like obviously you can't 
you can't arrest, let alone convict somebody solely on this you idea of like weird about yeah. oh they like <laughs> exactly. didn't really react like we thought they should, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he so Sepulveda eventually stopped voluntarily talking to the police. Um, not that he like would like deny talking to them, but he like stopped doing interviews with them. Like he just wouldn't. But again, it's like, wouldn't you? I think at that point he was like, you're not arresting me. I'm not going to. Some people might be like, he didn't want to incriminate himself by accident, which is fair. But yeah, there's like two points of view. It's like he didn't want to accidentally incriminate himself. But maybe he was also trying to be like, okay, the. Hey, I'm moving on. Yeah, I just don't. I can't deal with this anymore. I'm not under arrest, so I shouldn't have to. Well, and he. It seemed like he very much wanted to move on and or hide the fact that he did it. Um, He left Abilene at some point. Um, I think this was like fairly close to after the trial. Um, Or not the trial, after the murder. Um, His last known residence was Baltimore, Maryland. I don't know that anybody really knows where he is now. He might still be there, but... Um, in Servo's family's eyes, however, uh, Sepulveda definitely did it. Like, that's worth mentioning. Her family thinks that he did it. Yeah. Her father was quoted as saying, um, it'll never be resolved, but I can't stand that someone thinks he's going to get away with this. I'm pretty obsessed with that. Um, it seems her family and friends have not given up on her case being solved. Uh, her mother also said it was suspicious that he didn't come to her funeral. That is um, weird. I think he had already left town at that point, actually. He left pretty quickly. That's kind of a so, red flag, too. <laughs> yeah, like, it's kind of weird. But, that's like, but again, that's like number is one it weird enough to... to yeah. yeah. I don't know. Well, and especially because he kind of... I think he knew he was the main suspect. Well, like, so, but, but I mean, if you think about it, if he hadn't... If he had... If he didn't do it, then he's not thinking about these things the same way we are this is true this is true you know he's probably like yeah i'm gonna leave town i was already planning on doing it like it's it's horrible that my ex-girlfriend died but at the same time like i said it's like that's that was like your girl that you were gonna leave your wife for like he left his fiance and his child for this woman he was clearly in love with her i mean we don't know for sure that he was like pining for her because it didn't seem like he had he hadn't done even anything contacted to, her, had he? Yeah, like... What you were saying, yeah, so... Yeah, so... I don't know. Um, 23-year-old, tra- 23-year-old Brian Travers, on the other hand, um, seemed to be solely a suspect based on, like, his proximity to the murder. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. he had seen her, like, earlier in that night, and that usually almost... He was the last person to 10. see her. As- he was the last person to see her alive, other than the killer, yeah. Yeah. Whether or not he was the killer, whatever. Yeah. Um... Again, I don't believe that he did it because from what I understand, like, he really was into her and, but not in a way that, like, he would have, like, killed her. I know there was, I did, I did see one theory that was, like, what if he, like, followed her back to her apartment and heard her talking to her ex-boyfriend and this, like, pissed him off, but, like... Well, so here's the thing. I don't really believe that one, but... So, according to Brian, um, him and Jennifer had had a brief intimate relationship, but at one point she had said that she kind of wanted to focus on her career, she didn't really want to be in a relationship, um, but I think a lot of people, in truth, were like, she just wasn't into him. Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, so... And she didn't want to hurt his feelings, and maybe... It was, like, an unrequited love type thing that he was, like, this, I mean, this isn't fair. Like, I deserve her just, like, we don't know that that's true, but. Yeah, I mean, I guess in that case, like, maybe, you know, if it sucks when a girl's, like, oh, yeah, I'm not ready for a relationship. And then if he had, like, showed up to her apartment and heard her talking to someone and being, like, I love you. I'll see you later. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Then he'd be, like, okay, so she just wasn't ready for a relationship with me, which means that I'm pissed. So, like, I could kind of get that, but that's more of a stretch to me than her ex-boyfriend doing it. 
but I do mm-hmm. think I'll say that it's very clear that whoever killed her knew her like intimately, like personally. It wasn't like a surprise attack. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we like mentioned that explicitly, but I feel like that's that's like the most clear, <laughs> yeah, like fact of the case. I oh think. no, she she one hundred percent knew whoever killed her, and maybe um, her and friends. Maybe it was kind of like a kinky something or other gone wrong um that i guess Maybe that could have been I... but blunt force trauma i don't know yeah choking maybe but blunt force trauma well and again it's it's very clear that she knew her killer mm-hmm. um but her friends like seem to think that she's not really the kind of person that would have let very many men into her apartment late at night like yeah and i think I don't know. And there's no forced entry. Like, the door wasn't, like, broken in or anything when the manager got there. Or the maintenance employee. I can't remember what he was. But um, Brian Travers immediately hired a lawyer once he realized realized he was a suspect. Which, again, is, like, not Not particularly incriminating. Um, But in... He didn't, when he was talking to the police, he didn't really bring up the whole story about Jennifer thinking she was being followed until a few days later, which people think is somewhat incriminating because it's like he, like, made up that story. Like, that seems like you find out somebody was murdered and they were truthfully afraid that somebody was following them. That would seem to me like the first thing I would bring up. Unless it was more kind of nonchalant when she was like oh i think someone's you know maybe she wasn't that concerned about it or maybe he he wasn't that concerned about it so he just completely like had forgotten about it forgot about it yeah um i I guess that's possible stick with me though i feel like but i mean it kind of i to me it would kind of depend on how what her reaction was like if she was like oh my god i think someone's following us like we should call the police whatever but if she's just like Uh oh it's kind of weird that car's been behind us for a couple miles or whatever that's completely different i think yeah you know that's fair like you think he just kind of like it didn't even occur to him that that was like an important piece of information yeah i feel like that's a possibility you know Or, or what you said that that was like he like admitted it at on purpose because he was like oh i i can just bring up this random kind of story because it'll make me look less guilty i don't know i also think there's like um i don't know what it's called but it's basically like the study of like witness testimonies and how like witnesses you can't remember everything unless you're intentionally trying to remember it. And so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they, even with completely good intentions, sometimes get things wrong because Uh that's just how their brain remembered them or observed them or like summarized them. And so I think that's a valid point to make there too. But Mm -hmm. again, again, like the neat, if I was an investigator on this case and I was like, Oh, that's weird that he didn't bring that up. I would know that, the nature of like the murder itself was so like kind of intimate I guess if you could call it that that there's no way that it was like some random I mean I guess it's possible that it was someone she knew that was following them but it would also be like wouldn't you recognize their car well and here's the thing she the attack occurred in her bedroom they're pretty sure Mm -hmm. and she that means she answered the door saw that it was whoever somebody she knew let them into the apartment locked the door behind them and went into the bedroom i mean i guess we don't know for sure that she locked the door behind him but like walked into the bedroom and was okay with whoever this was like following her into the bedroom Mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's a good point See, and that's why that's why i kind of i mean if i had to choose from the two suspects we've been given that's why i would choose the ex-boyfriend because Clearly, uh-huh. she's been, you know, in a long-term relationship with him. She'd be comfortable with him, you know, yeah. in her in her bedroom sort of thing. So, I don't know. But also, like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. But then, but then, like you said, it's possible that she had an intimate relationship with whatever. Is his name Brian? I keep getting him confused. His name's Brian, yeah. Brian, you know, she had possibly had an intimate relationship with him, so maybe she wouldn't be that 
weirded out by him coming into her bedroom. I don't know. So kind of playing devil's advocate here, but if it was me, I would be way more inclined to have an ex like follow me into especially an ex that I like again, he had blatantly lied to her, but like But they weren't like he wasn't a threat to her necessarily. I could I would like be more like devil's, like malicious. Either. And again, maybe I'm adding context where there's no context, but like if Brian was like this guy who was clearly interested in me, but I wasn't really interested in him. I don't know that I would like walk into the bedroom with him knowing he would follow me. Like, I don't know if I would do that. Like, I don't think I would put myself in that position. An ex-boyfriend, however, who like I used to live with, I might do that, you know? Yeah. Well, because you wouldn't really, it wouldn't, it would almost be like second nature. You wouldn't think twice about mm -hmm. it. But if she was trying not to, um, give Brian give him the wrong impression hope or anything like that then I would I, I totally get what you're saying that she just she wouldn't have even gone into the bedroom willingly but I guess you could also say that maybe she didn't go into the bedroom willingly at all yeah right True. like it is it's possible that like he could have like picked her up maybe not hurt her or anything but I don't know I guess it would depend on how trusting she is of like men in general maybe if she would like let someone like playfully like pick her up and be like well, oh i don't know and like i could i could be wrong on this particular fact but i do believe that um the like evidence that they found of sexual assault was just like bruising like bruising in a way that would indicate sexual assault like i don't know that they like confirmed that, that like, there was like, like a rape kit or anything i don't know that. that they did a rape kit i didn't find that so you never do one when they need one. I know. Yeah. Or they, like, dismiss it. And it's like, bitch, come on. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, that's an interesting fact, too, because then it's like, well, was it sexual assault? I don't know. Well, Could I think... Been just assault that... It was, like... They, like... It obviously was, like, evident enough because they put it in the autopsy report, like, <laughs> evidence of sexual assault... But I'm just saying that, like, it seems like the evidence was that she was, like, bruised in places that would indicate that. Mm -hmm. right. um, but, like, it makes me wonder if she had consensual sex with her attacker. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess so, because that was my first thought when you're like, oh, the two suspects are her friend slash sort of, like, romantic, like, love interest sort of. And then her ex-boyfriend, I was like, okay, well, if it started in the bedroom, to me, like, my first thought would be something kind of sex gone wrong sort of thing. And then my mm -hmm. second thought would be, okay, it was like a jealous man <laughs> who killed her, which I guess both could be true, right? Mm -hmm. So, no. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's pretty much all I've got. Um, Jennifer's father, Norman... Um, has not stopped looking for her killer. He runs a website called uh, justiceforjennifer.org just kind of to keep the, her memory alive and to keep the case kind of alive in a way, even though it's cold. The Abilene police force at this point can't really do anything until somebody leaves a tip. Um, I don't know. At this point, it's, it's weird to have hope still, but because I think it, cases like this are weird where like, there's consensus on who pretty much everybody thinks did it, but there's no evidence. So right. like well, where how would you even how part. would you even convict yeah. somebody on this? Like how would you convict somebody on this? So Well, and that's that's the really tough part too, I think, for her family is they I mean They're pretty convinced it was Ralph. Everyone everyone knows that it like 99.9% .9 sure that it's one of those two people right and mm -hmm. so it's not like it's it's a case where there's going to be some random person that they're like oh we match dna with like this other serial killer person or whatever it's not a case like that it's like we know it's one of those two people but we probably will never be able to prove it which i think is almost worse because like you said it's like you can still hold out hope that there'll be some like miraculous dna match or something mm -hmm, exactly but, but you can't in a case like this because it's pretty cut and dry that it's one of those two people but there just isn't any evidence to you know arrest them and book them but anyway yeah 
Anyway, thanks for joining us for our 21st episode. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be many more to come. Um, as always, make sure to check us out on social media. Um, in- Instagram is Who What Where Podcast, and then we're on uh, Facebook and YouTube as well. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Um, we will see you guys in the next episode. Bye.